Hello folks, how are you doing? This session is going to provide a brief uh, overview of a new textbook out from OpenStax College called Introduction to Philosophy. Uh, my name is Nathan Smith and I am the senior contributing author on the textbook. Uh, the textbook is designed to, you know, be a general overview of Intro to Philosophy. It's supposed to meet the basic requirements for a general uh, Intro to Philosophy class. And it's designed, like most uh, OER, to be used uh, either as a supplement, as a main text, or to have selections taken and built on. I just introduce you to the folks uh, who wrote the book. That's that's me, there, um, and I was joined by several contributing authors on most of the chapters, and then a, a host of reviewers, and also people who uh, provided instructor resources, uh, test banks, PowerPoint slides, a comprehensive manual. There's uh, a ton of great stuff here with the textbook, like with most of OpenStax textbooks. The thing I want to focus on today is um, kind of what I think is the unique feature of this um, Intro to Philosophy textbook. We set out uh, with the goal of creating a textbook that was general, genuinely multicultural and global in its approach. Um, and I think we achieved that. Um, you know, one of the challenges uh, with um, philosophy as a discipline is that it has historically, um, not just um, by default or by omission, uh, left out groups of people, but it has actively and through internal justifications of philosophical authors excluded the perspectives of women, of non-European um, cultures, despite the fact that there are vast histories and very rich traditions of philosophy in certainly the Islamic world as well as India, China, and then even in many indigenous cultures. So what we tried to do with this book was to highlight that um, try to bring some of that out. I'll show you a bit of that. In addition, we tried to make the book genuinely practical, and I'll show you some of the features that that uh, highlight that um, do that. Some of the things we do in the book are uh, pieces like uh, think like a philosopher, or write like a philosopher, read like a philosopher. These are inserts where um, students can engage in active participation. Um, doing philosophy. So they provide like a guide for instructors to kind of give students an overview or give them a sense of what it is like to do to do philosophy. Table of contents. And what you'll see is a fairly typical layout of a table of contents. Introduction, some critical thinking, history of philosophy. And then we touch on them major thematic areas of an intro to philosophy class, logic, metaphysics, epistemology. One thing of note is that we spend a fair bit of time on value theory, uh, normative ethics, applied ethics, political philosophy. Um, that area is the fastest growing area of professional philosophy. So I think it's valuable to spend a fair bit of time on those topics. They also have a pretty practical and interest for students. Um, I want to highlight a few things in this table of contents that may be uh, unique. So first when we do the critical thinking, research and reading and writing chapter, this uh, chapter is really focused on sort of the mechanics of, of thinking. Um, the psychology of thought, cognitive biases as a, um, a barrier to good critical thinking. Um, 
talk about how to develop good habits of mind. And then we spend a bit of time on um, research methods and uh, reading and writing philosophy papers. So this is really practical stuff, uh, like how to find sources on the internet, how to evaluate and uh, fact check those sources when you're searching for things. When we look at the uh, reading philosophy, again, some very practical sort of techniques for being a better reader of philosophy. And the same thing when we get to the uh, uh, writing uh, of philosophy. Sort of spend some time with some exercises on how to write a better philosophy paper. Next, when we do the uh, history of philosophy, you'll see that um, we spend a fair bit of time on the early history of philosophy, which doesn't even get to the Greeks. So we spend time with the indigenous philosophers around the world um, and uh, looking at African world, um, North America, um, the Aztecs, the Mayans, as well as um, others. We then spend um, a fair bit of time on the classical Indian tradition and the Chinese tradition. The second history chapter um, is the one that goes more towards the uh, traditional sort of history of philosophy. Um, we of course start in Egypt but then quickly jump to the Greeks and Romans. Um, and then we work our way up through the classical age, looking at a variety of influences on um, scholastic philosophy in Europe. We, we end with a, another sort of historical approach. Um, this looks uh, specifically at uh, 20th century historical schools of thought that may be um, somewhat less dominant than the Anglo-American analytic tradition that really guides most of the book. So the last thing that I wanted to show you in this book is when we set out to create the, a book that was uh, more multicultural and inclusive than a traditional philosophy textbook, one of the things we didn't want to do is simply have a section devoted to a particular, um, you know, non-Western philosophy. We wanted that view of philosophy to be incorporated throughout the book. So one of the principles we used when um, introducing concepts is that if a concept could be introduced uh, using a non-Western, uh, non-male perspective, then we should use that perspective to introduce the concept. Uh, for instance, in epistemology, um, there's a classic problem in the problem of knowledge uh, known as the Gettier problem, where a person meets the criteria for knowledge. They have justified true belief, but they don't have what we would normally call knowledge. Um, interestingly, another Indian philosopher, a Buddhist philosopher, uh, Dharmakirti, uh, has an example that's very similar to a Gettier type example, so we include that there. Um, likewise, when discussing the dream, like Descartes' dream argument, for instance, we, we introduced the dream argument using the Chinese Taoist philosopher, Zheng Shu who has a, uh, um, a sort of a similar, uh, I mean, it's a different um, uh, story, but kind of introduces the concept that we need to get across to students. So the idea here is that we can use, you know, excellent examples to illustrate concepts for students that are drawn from a variety of sources, and that way we integrate um, the philosophy of different regions right into um, the textbook.